I think I'm gonna call this PC Project Icarus, because we're gonna fly as close as we can to the sun and try not to get burned. Today's video is brought to you by NordPass. If you own your own business, there's a good chance you're doing password management wrong. A sticky note under the keyboard used to be acceptable, but so was keeping a spare key under your welcome mat. Whether it's banking, procurement, web management, or simple business operations, NordPass makes managing online passwords a breeze with their easy to use desktop and mobile applications. It allows your organization to store all of your company's passwords in one location and distribute access to employees. Thanks to NordPass's zero-knowledge architecture, your passwords are encrypted before they ever reach their servers. Visit nordpass.com slash craftbusiness where you can get a free three-month trial at registration. Again, that's nordpass.com slash craftbusiness with code craftbusiness and get started today. And again, a huge thanks to NordPass for sponsoring today's video. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. It has been quite a long time since I've put together a build guide, mainly because parts have been either completely unavailable or completely unaffordable or just plain not worth it. So today we are going to put together a brand new system and I had a very specific goal in mind and that was to get absolute top performance without going and breaking the laws of physics or your wallet. What exactly do I mean by that? Obviously, everyone's got to have a budget, and the budget on this one is fairly high. This whole system will run you about $2,700 when it's all said and done. But these are pretty much the top flight parts before you start reaching the levels of diminishing returns with the extreme high end of graphics cards, CPUs, and etc. that are on the market today. One of the things that frustrates me about a lot of written and even YouTube guides when it comes to build videos is, what is the fastest PC you can build today? That's the easiest question there is to answer. You order the best parts that are available today. That would be an RTX 4090. That would be a 13900K or a 7950X 3D. Uh, that's as much memory as you can possibly throw at it. And then you throw in custom water cooling so you can overclock to the moon and back and $6,000 later, you're left with a PC that, while faster than everyone else, is also $6,000. So what do we have on the docket for today? This system's gonna be built around an AMD Ryzen 9 7900X 3D. This is a 12 core, 24 threaded CPU with a 4.4 gigahertz base clock and a 5.6 gigahertz max boost under precision boost overdrive. It also has 128 megabytes of L3 cache, which is using AMD's 3D V cache, allowing much higher capacities of cache with much lower latency on the chip. The reason I chose this CPU in particular is for that 128 megabytes of L3 cache versus the 7900X, which only has 76 megabytes on board. This gives it an advantage in both AMD and Intel chips, especially when it comes to gaming performance. For the motherboard, we've got the ASRock X670E Tai Chi Carrera. Now, this is a fairly expensive board at $500, but as such, it has pretty much every bell and whistle that you could ask for, especially me as more of the networking and server type guy. It's got killer networking on board in the E3100 2.5 gig network out back instead of just using the Realtek chip like a lot of these boards will do. It's also got killer Wi-Fi 6E with the 1675X chipset on board. Obviously, being an X670 chipset also means we get DDR5 and PCI Express 5.0 as well. Now, the graphics card is going to be a little bit of a contentious choice because of the crowded marketplace around this price point. We're going with the Zotac Amp Extreme 4070 Ti, and that runs about $879 right now. It's using the all-new Ada Lovelace 104 GPU from NVIDIA with 7,680 CUDA cores, 60 RT cores, and 12 gigabytes of GDDR6X with a total bandwidth of about 504 gigabytes per second. Now, I did go back and forth so many times about what graphics card I wanted to use in this. Did I want to go with the 7900XT, the 7900XTX, or go with the 4070 Ti from NVIDIA? In the end, I kind of went this route because I felt this gave us the best bang for buck, especially in games that are starting to use more DLSS and ray tracing. AMD is definitely a fantastic option at this price point, and I couldn't fault you for choosing either of those other graphics cards. But given this build, we wanted all-out performance in every single game. I got to give the nod to Team Green here. 
For cooling, Linus Tech Tips did a video a couple of weeks ago where I think he said it best, and that is a lot of people are overthinking how much cooling they need to put into their CPU. And in most cases, you should just keep it simple. And that's exactly what we're doing with the Noctua NHD15. This is the best air cooler that has ever been made and beats out most all-in-one liquid coolers as well. Best of all, it's only around $120. Next up, a bit of an interesting choice, but you're gonna wanna hear out my logic here. For memory, we're going with 32 gigabytes of Patriot Viper Venom 6200. Now, obviously we could have gone for 64 gigabytes or even 128 gigabytes, but there's a very specific reason that we chose 32 gigs and 6200 for a speed. And it's because Ryzen hates a couple of different things. First up, dual rank configurations. That is populating all four of your memory slots for this two channel memory configuration. Ryzen just does not deal well, especially with the 7000 series CPUs of having all of its memory slots populated. You're not likely to get much above 5000 or 5200 speeds if you use all four slots. And secondly, if you wanted 64 gigs, that means you would have to go with two 32 gigabyte sticks. And unfortunately, those aren't ready in those capacities at good enough speeds yet to run with only two sticks. So 32 gigs should be number one, more than enough for pretty much any game that we wanna to run today. And number two, give us the best possible speed on this CPU. For storage, it was pretty much a no-brainer. I opted for a Patriot Viper VP4300 2TB Gen 4x4 NVMe drive. This drive will run you about $130, and it's pretty much as good as they get. 7400 megabyte per second sustained read speeds and 6800 megabyte per second sustained write speeds. The uh, randoms are pretty darn good as well. Next up, we have what a lot of people would consider to be the boring bits, but I actually believe you should start here when you're planning a new build, and that is your case and your power supply. First up, we've got the Be Quiet Pure Base 500 Tempered Glass White Edition. This is a fantastic case with not a lot of extra frills and everything you need to put together a top flight system like this. First off, it's only $117, so it's not gonna break your bank. Secondly, it supports full EATX motherboards, so uh, we should be able to toss this ASRock Tai Chi in there with some room to spare. It's got two included Silent Wing 140mm fans, a tempered glass side panel, room for a 190mm tower cooler, and best of all, no extra spent on RGB. In fact, if you picked up a theme from this build, it is that there's no money at all spent on bespoke RGB parts. That's because I didn't want to spend an extra $200 when it's not allocated directly to performance. Everything that you see in front of me was picked for speed, not for looks. Last but not least, we've got the power supply, and we're going with a Be Quiet Pure Power 13 850 watt titanium unit. Now, again, this is a fairly expensive unit at $250, but it does have one major advantage, and that it has native PCI Express 5.0 support for your 12 volt high power rails that the NVIDIA cards are needing these days. That means no adapters, no dongles, no daisy chaining things together just to power your graphics card and eventually make it catch fire. No, just one cable, It's all you need. Add into that titanium efficiency, full modular design, and essentially silent operation, and it works out to be a pretty good unit. Wrapping this all up before we put it all together, this build would run you about $2,685 as I priced out this morning. Not a bad package considering the amount of power that we're gonna get out of this. But of course, we need to see where the rubber meets the road. Let's go ahead and get this PC together, run it through its paces, and I'll see you after the break.
Nice thing about a build that takes multiple days is uh, you get to drink multiple beers, just not on the same day. So even with the slight modification needed to make the motherboard actually fit inside of this case, this was still one of the easiest builds that I've done in quite some time. Even with the tight fit of all the components inside of here, the motherboard, the NHD15 cooler, the memory, this absolute beast of a graphics card, everything went together with basically no drama, a feat that is surprisingly rare as components are getting bigger and bigger as of late. Before we get into the review portion of this video, I do want to give a shout out to Patriot, Zotac, Azrock, and Be Quiet, all for sending out parts to make this build possible. As with all reviews on the channel, no money changed hands, opinions are 100% my own, the companies involved get absolutely no input over the content in this video, nor do they get to see this video before you do. All of the parts in this particular build were 100% requested by me with no suggestions made by manufacturers either. So this is actually what I would build for a PC today if I went out and built a PC for around this budget. With all of that out of the way, let's go ahead and start with the elephant in the room, or in the case as it were, with the Zotac Amp Extreme RTX 4070 Ti. This three and a half slot card makes my RTX 3090 look downright pocketable. While I did make sure to check CPU cooler clearance in the PureBase 500, although not motherboard clearance, I did no such research on the RTX 4070 Ti. That was more of a happy little accident, as it has only about a half inch of clearance from the front of the case. We'll be going over full performance and even overclocking the system in the next video, but out of the box performance was still hugely impressive. The 4070 Ti managed a 2850 MHz boost clock on the core with a memory clock of 2625. But what's really insane is just how quiet the Amp Extreme is. Fans topped out at only 60% and were basically inaudible thanks to the sound deadening inside of the PureBase 500 chassis. But you're choking the airflow in that case. It needs a mesh front panel and the fans are weights, blah, 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 blah. Actually, temperatures were even more impressive than noise levels, topping out at just 73 degrees on the GPU core and 70 degrees Celsius on the memory. At peak, the card drew around 305 watts of power, again, without overclocking, proving that this case has plenty of airflow for a system just like this. Now, recently, there has been quite a bit of controversy around AM5-based CPUs, specifically the X3D series of chips, and their uh, explosive potential, not strictly speaking of their gaming performance. I'm sure there were some people who immediately turned off this video upon seeing me using a 7900X3D. But let's take a look at what I recorded out of the box before jumping to conclusions that these are just ticking time bombs. A huge shout out to Steve and the Gamers Nexus crew for their failure analysis of the X3D CPUs. And if you haven't seen his three-part series, I will leave links down in the video description. In short, there were some Ajisa settings that allowed system on chip voltage to climb to 1.4 volts or even higher. This caused a degradation of the IO die, leading to current and temperature runaways, especially on boards with middling overcurrent protection. New Ajisa code issued by AMD has since made its way into BIOS updates for most motherboard OEMs, and one of the main fixes is to limit system on chip voltage to a 1.3 volt maximum. But some consumers may just purchase a board and start using it, so I opted to run the CPU with the BIOS from before all of this started. Under gaming workloads, the SoC saw a maximum voltage of 1.287, which is well below AMD's recommended max even after the Ajisa updates. This was also with the memory set to 6200 under Expo, which often caused system on chip voltage to run much higher than defaults on most motherboards. So while that is fantastic news, clock speeds on the 7900X3D were a bit underwhelming as I only observed 4.9 GHz on the fastest cores during gaming. This is a CPU that should clock upwards of 5.6 GHz on a couple cores through Precision Boost Overdrive. And with defaults on everything but the memory, I just wasn't seeing that. Again, this is using the Ajisa and BIOS that predate any of the voltage controversy, so this isn't just an overcorrection in Azeroth's BIOS, as I received this board in mid-April and I'm running the BIOS that it shipped with. Like I mentioned, in the next video, I'm going to do a deep dive into safely getting the most out of the system, either through minor overclocking or just making sure things like PBO are enabled and working properly. With all of the changes made to Ajisa over the last week or two, I think a proper review revisit is definitely warranted. 
With clocks sitting just shy of 5 GHz, the CPU only managed to draw around 90 watts of power during gameplay, which is well under AMD's 130 watt rating, so there's definitely some room to grow here. As such, the NHD15 had no problem at all keeping the CPU cool, with a max temperature of just 63 degrees during prolonged gaming stress testing. I expect every number, temperature, wattage, and clock speeds to be much higher the next time around. Speaking of the motherboard, the ASRock Tai Chi Carrera board definitely has some fantastic things going for it, like multiple M.2 NVMe ports that all run at PCIe 5.0. However, there's also one glaring issue, and that is the expansion over PCI Express when you're not using M.2. You see, there are only two X16 slots on this entire ATX motherboard. However, the bottom one is fully disabled if you're running an X16 card up in the top slot. That's all well and good though, since the 3.5 slot 4070Ti covers the bottom slot anyway. But this being an ATX board just kind of goes to exemplify how much expansion we're giving up in sake of graphics cards, and especially with the shrinking number of PCI Express lanes on the CPUs these days. Yes, I know there are enthusiast and workstation options out there from both AMD with Threadripper and Intel with their new Xeon W lineup. However, you're going to get about one third of the multi-core performance for double the price if you need that PCI expansion. And honestly, that's just not a trade-off that most professionals are willing to make. Other than that, there's not much to complain about on this board, and the PCI Express issue is definitely more of an AMD side of things rather than ASRock. The system is very well laid out, all of the ports are exactly where they should be, there's tons of fan expandability, in fact with all of the fans that I have running in the system I didn't need to install a fan hub, and every single plug was very easily reachable. Now obviously, as I dive more into performance tweaking of the 7900X3D in the next video, we're going to start to see a lot of the advantages of the Tai Chi with its 24-phase power delivery, but that is also going to have to wait until next time. One thing I have been more than happy with is the Be Quiet Pure Power 13 power supply, mainly due to its native PCI Express 5.0 support. Let's face it, even if the Zotac 4070Ti used triple or even quad 8-pin PCIe plugs instead of the single 12-volt high power cable, cable management would have been an absolute nightmare. And don't even get me started on the 8-pin to 12-pin dongle that's included in the Zotac box. But coupled with the lack of RGB fans and RGB strips covering every single square inch of the inside of this case, there were only four cables required on the power supply and it wound up being one of the cleanest builds inside and out that I've ever done on this channel. Overall, I am thrilled with the way the system is turning out so far, though as I mentioned with the Ryzen 7900X3D, there's still some tuning that needs to be done before I do full-on gaming benchmarks. I am also planning on testing the 4070Ti against my RTX 3090 in this same system, mainly to see how they compare, and even with the 4070Ti being nearly a $900 card, seeing how the cost of performance has improved over this last generation of GPUs. And before we go, a huge shout out to Micro Center for sponsoring today's build. Whether you're a seasoned PC builder or a first time shopper, Micro Center is there to help with their knowledgeable associates and a wide range of PC parts to fit your build and your budget. Use Micro Center's PC Builder to put together your wish list and make your dream build a reality today. With 25 stores across the US, the best selection, and knowledgeable staff to help you along the way, Micro Center is the best place to build your next PC. And for a limited time, new customers can get $25 off all new processors. Make sure to click the link down in the video description for more details. And thanks again to Micro Center for sponsoring today's video. And that's going to do it for me in today's video. Make sure to hit that thumbs up button and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. And on your way down there, affiliate links for all the products in today's build are down in the video description. If you like the content you see on the channel and want to help support me in what I do, there's a couple ways you can do that. First off, head on over to craftcomputing.store and grab yourself some official merch and start drinking like a pro. Secondly, you can join me over on Patreon, where a minimum donation of $1 per month gets you exclusive access to my Discord server, where you can chat with myself and the other hosts from Talking Heads. Thank you all so much for watching, and as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys.
here for today, I had to buy based on the name alone, and I think you will understand why. From Hop Valley in Eugene, Oregon, it is the Stash Bandicoot Hazy IPA, clocking in at 8%. Stash Bandicoot packs a punch with our stash of Citra, Atanum, and Chinook Cryo hops. Discover a juicy jungle with notes of apricot and red berries in this hazy imperial IP. So Hop Valley also makes one of my favorite uh, big ABV IPAs to buy if you're out and about and you feel like an IPA, and that is the uh, Cryo Stash IPA. And this is basically a hazy version of that with their, uh, their Cryo hops. Uh, very much looking forward to it. Definitely got me thinking of red berries. Better than dago berries, am I right? Yep. Yeah. That was a Crash Bandicoot reference. Mm -hmm. Obviously. It wasn't. You know, unlike you, Rhett, I was, I was actually alive and like a person in the 90s. <laughs> no, it's just that my preferred PlayStation 1 games were like oh. Metal Gear Solid. Yeah. Well, this is N64. Crash Bandicoot wasn't on N64. It was a Sony PlayStation exclusive. Oh, that that's right. I was thinking Banjo Kazooie. Yeah. I totally was. Oh, that's on film. Oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> nice thing about a build that takes multiple days is uh you get to drink multiple beers. Just not on the same day. Beer for the second half is from Revision Brewing Company. It is Dr. Lupulin Diabolical 3X India Pale Ale. Clocking in, I believe, at 11.6%. Now, this is a beer that comes out from time to time, and it is always fantastic. 11.3%. Uh, IBUs are confidential, which I love. The art and science of awesome. Somewhat of an anomaly, Dr. Lupinlin is brewed with loads of hops, but is not too bitter. An intimidating brew that's easy to drink, but without the heat. Is that mango having a pleasant conversation with Dank? Yep, the experiment to create perfection is alive. And at 11.3%, look how freaking clear that beer is. I have had Pilsners with more cloud than that. And this is an 11.3% triple IPA. <clears throat> like I mentioned, I've had this brew multiple times over the years, either on draft or in cans. It is a fantastic throwback to mid to early 2000s West Coast IPAs, but in a triple form. It is crystal clear, it's smooth, it's not overly bitter. It's just delicious. Maybe not for a, a super hot summer day like this, but uh, I wouldn't mind drinking this in air conditioning while watching someone else mow my lawn. Cheers, everyone.